This is Casey Bell, host of the Shake Up Learning Show and a proud member of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to right now. The opinions expressed are those of each individual host. For more great podcasts, visit edupodcastnetwork.com and get ready because the learning begins in three, two, one. to episode 80 of the Google Teacher Tribe podcast, your source for the latest Google for Education news, tips, tricks, and ideas you can use in class tomorrow. I'm Casey Bell from Shake Up Learning. And I'm Matt Miller from Ditch That Textbook. And today we are going to be going on spring break with all of you. And, uh, right? It's about time, for goodness sake. It is March as we're recording this. And for so many of us, we are either coming up on spring break. I know um, for our friends in Canada, you all call it March break a lot of times. So you may already be there. And so we're going to have some fun today. And we're going to look at some Google tools that you can use on your spring break that can also be used in the classroom. We're going to be talking about some things that you can do on spring break. I think um, it's good to have Casey back. So maybe she's ready for a little bit of spring break. Is that safe to say? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So we've got some really good stuff for you, along with all of the classics, all of the regular stuff. So I say we get into this. What do you think, Casey? Let's do it. Hey, Tribe. Let's dig into our Google News and updates. And we actually have several things that have been trickling in to G Suite that we want you to know about. And the first one is called the new priority page in Google Drive. So what you're going to see here is is pretty interesting. So I don't actually have access to this yet. So I'm, I'm just reading the update and, and explaining. There's a screenshot that we're going to share in the show notes as well. But this is how they have explained it. You're going to use the priority page in Drive to see the documents that Google is trying to predict are the most relevant to you right now. So they're using machine learning suggestions and they're based on all kinds of different signals coming from your activity inside your drive. So on each suggested document, you can also take actions in line without having to separately navigate to the doc in question, like replying to a comment or reviewing recent edits. That's pretty awesome. I love that because sometimes it seems like it takes me forever to open up some giant spreadsheet or whatever it is that I'm working on. So we've got this screenshot here in the update where you can kind of get an idea of what's coming and see those. So I'm kind of curious if this is really a new iteration of what they've called the quick access, which is sort of what pops up by default now when you open Drive. And it, it, it is using machine learning to try to predict the things that you're going to open. But maybe this is like a step up, I'm thinking, because because I can see some overlap with this. And you'll see in in the the screenshot the ability to see different uh, folders and workspaces and your different documents. But I like the fact that we can just open the comment or open the attachment and see what's going on. So I like the fact that we're going to be able to do more inside Drive without having to separately open things. Now, it looks like this is on rapid release starting on March 18th. And scheduled release starting rolling out on April 1st. So I think everybody will begin to see this in mid-April. Yeah, this looks really, really cool. I am, I think, most excited about this part that says workspaces, where you where it looks like you can create a tile or, you know, a, a specific folder where you've got all these different files and then you have access to them. So it's not just what's recent, it's not just what's alphabetical, it's you know, you've selected to put those things there. So I am really interested to see how this looks when it finally rolls out to everybody. We've got another update that's kind of a big deal. And this one comes in Google Sheets. So in the past, it's been kind of a pain to insert images um, into Sheets. 
you'd have to use the image function and just use publicly hosted images in the past. And that has changed. So now we are able to insert any image, including those that are saved, you know, right there on your computer or your device. You can insert an image into one cell or into a span of cells using the insert menu. So it looks an awful lot like it does in docs and slides and drawings and a lot of the other things. You've got the option to upload an image. You can take a snapshot with your webcam. You can pull images out of your drive. And then you can put them into just one particular cell or into sort of like a span of cells. And so that is supposed to be coming out here pretty soon. And I know for some of us that are real big on spreadsheets, I know I always like to quote Alice Keeler on this one. She always says the answer is always a spreadsheet. So probably for her and for others like her, this is a pretty big deal. Yes, I am looking forward to this as well, because I've never really liked the way that images work inside sheets. So I am super excited about that one. But you know what, Matt, I am really, really super excited can I can I put too many adjectives in front of that? You can never put too many super excited into this show. <laughs> can we like super excited squared or cubed or something? Mm-hmm. Yes. Y'all, are you ready for this? Carmen San Diego in Google Earth. Ah! What? Okay. All all of all of you new young teachers don't know what we're talking about, but everybody else who was a child in the 90s has possibly obsessed over Carmen San Diego. Where in the Where world in is the world Carmen? Is Carmen San Diego. Sorry. <laughs> oh, oh, I didn't know you could sing it, Matt. So oh, apparently yeah. apparently Matt was way more into it than I was. Just so a little bit. uh yeah. Anyway, y'all, this looks super cool. You can now open it up inside Google Earth. And when you do, it has a retro look and feel to to the pop up. So it pops up like a sidebar uh, when you get your your different assignments. So you click on begin the chase inside Google Earth and you're going to get welcome to Acme gumshoe are you ready for your first assignment and then you click next and the the text and even the button are sort of those pixelated letters and the the um graphics are a little pixelated as well of course they still look light years better than they used to (laughs) and you get your your entire assignment you click start and then when it opens up google earth it's going to open a sidebar and it's going to give you a little bit of an overview on how to use the different tools and navigate through the game but it looks super fun and i think we may have some new fans coming up through the ranks of Carmen San Diego in our classes. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I uh, I am nerding out about this like pretty seriously. Um, this this goes right up there with when they put Mario Kart into Google Maps. I was really excited about that. When they turned Google Maps into Pac-Man, I was really excited about that too. So this goes right up there. I don't know. I'm going to have I haven't gotten a chance to play it yet. So after I play it, who knows, it may go above all of those. Pretty cool. All right. Yeah. So I, I'll tell you too. Right now, I have it open. I'm supposed to interview some witnesses in London, and I've got to use the magnifying glass to choose the landmark, uh, either the Tower of London, Buckingham Palace, or the Tower Bridge. So it's definitely um, educational as well. Yay! Yes. Love it. Love it. Love it. <laughs> All right. So the last thing we've got for you in our news and updates, this comes from the keyword blog, and this is just the coolest thing, if you ask me. Um, the, The article says, driving change with rolling study halls. And so this comes from Talladega County, Alabama, and they're doing this cool thing. They're participating in this um, program called rolling study halls. And the idea is that they put Wi-Fi hotspots on to buses. And so kids are riding home on their buses that are Wi-Fi enabled. The students have their devices and then they also have onboard educators. So these are, you know, actual licensed teachers that are on board on the buses and sometimes even have fun educational activities planned. They're able to go work with students one-on-one. And so, you know, basically all of these kids, it says more than 7,000 students across 17 schools, they get on the bus and they're able to continue working. 
And so, you know, of course, they they do mention that student behavior is better on the bus because they have something to do. Surprise. But they it basically does extend the learning day for everybody. And so, you know, if you've got these engaging activities that they can do on the bus or if they do have some homework that they need to finish up, this is a great time to do that. And then what's also neat, too, is that um, the educators that are there on board get to continue to build those relationships with kids and give extra attention to the kids that need it. I just I love this whole thing all the way around. I think this is such an innovative approach to getting Internet access to you know kids that might not have it. You know, I know I live in an area of Indiana where Internet access is not widespread and it's not great. And so, you know, sending devices home sometimes is an exercise in futility if your internet is not working or if you just don't have it. And so this, I I just, I love everything about this because, you know, bus drivers will tell you that the behavior issues are always a problem. Kids tell you that they get bored on the bus. This just seems like it checks so many boxes. So really, really love this model. Yeah, this is fantastic. And and what an amazing way to extend the learning day. You know, I like to say learning doesn't have to end when the bell rings, that we have so many options for our students. So I I really hope that we'll begin to see maybe some grants or some other things to help fund these for for our schools. Yes, yes, totally agree. So if you want to read about that or anything else or Carmen San Diego, then you can head to, (laughs) can you tell I'm a little excited? Super excited. You can head to the show notes at googleteachertribe.com slash 80. All right, Tribe, like we were mentioning earlier, it is almost spring break for a lot of us. And with that, that extra time off and a little bit of extra rejuvenation, a little break from teaching and from learning. There's lots of things that we can do with that. I know um, with the days leading up to spring break, sometimes class is a little different than usual. And then with spring break actually happening, sometimes we've got a little bit of extra time to do some different stuff. So uh, Casey and I thought that we'd talk about some things related to spring break many of which are googly in some form, um, that, that might be sort of relevant right now. So um, this always makes me think of an activity that I always like to do in my um, high school Spanish classes. And my wife has done a version of this in her social studies classes before too. And the idea is that, you know, we've got all of these tools to help us with travel you know, a lot of times I found with my kids they're if they're not going on a spring break trip, it's kind of fun to think about what a spring break trip might be. And so what we would do is, you know, me being a Spanish teacher is that we would plan out a trip and I would even sometimes give them a budget of like how many imaginary dollars. Yes, imaginary dollars. I was not shelling out cash or handing them my credit card. Um that they could spend. And then they would go start to look through some of the tools that we have available. So, you know, we might use something like Google maps to figure out the different ways to get around a city that they wanted to visit. And then of course, we've also got the the ways to search for flights within Google that compares lots of different airlines. And so they could figure out how much that is. Um, I know even within Google Maps, it talks about the different stops that you have on public transportation. And so they would kind of make a a whole plan around all of that and figure out how much it was going to cost and where they were going to go. You can use Street View to drop yourself down on the street and see what that would look like. And so kind of blending all of these together and then maybe doing the, the report in the end on a Google Slides presentation. I think that's the way that it looked whenever whenever I did it. And so um, being able to put all those together, even um, by using Google My Maps, which we talked about last week, to create a custom map where you can drop pins and add information about what you might see if you visited there and how much it would cost to go. So, uh, you know, this is another one of those fun ways where you can possibly pull in some of that content into something that is very much at the forefront of of kids thoughts at at the time as we get close to spring break. Absolutely. And you know, it's it's the the time that we have in the classroom plus 
some of you may actually be doing some traveling on your own. And if you happen to be listening to this episode on your trek, we hope you are enjoying wherever the road takes you. But there are lots of travel tools that Google has as well. So I wanted to be sure and mention that I found this this blog post on the keyword blog called How I Started Traveling the World on My Own Thanks to Google. And it was actually tips from a solo female traveler where she shares not only her travels, but sort of how she used Google to support that. So throughout her journey, and one of the the tools that she used, and I've never even heard of it before, and I love traveling, so I was excited to find this one, is called Local Guides Connect. And it's a place to share tips, discoveries, and news with the community for people on Google Maps. So it's it's sort of a social type of platform that's going to connect back to your different trips. So you'll even see like someone shared the Carmen San Diego game that we mentioned earlier in Local Guides Connect. So there are ways to share links, to share tips and, and different things within that. And that's exactly how our, our little solo traveler here, v- Vandana, used it. So she she traveled the the world. She went to Norway, New Zealand, all kinds of places. And so she used the local guides to help her find those those special places as she went. So one, that can help you if you are actually traveling, but two, if you're creating those virtual travel experiences like Matt was mentioning, I thought this was a really cool tool. Yes. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. You know, I even noticed within her post, she even talked about using the Google Translate app when you're in a foreign country and you don't understand the language. And, you know, as being a a uh, language teacher, you know, I've seen the Google Translate feature get better and better. And of course, it does have the the lens feature where you can activate your camera and it will translate text right there on the screen for you. It's not perfectly accurate, um, but it is enough to, to get you by sometimes too. So, you know, even using that within activities in the class or on your travels can can be a useful thing. So yeah, I thought that was really a really good one to add. Now, depending on what you're doing over these uh, spring break days, if you're not going anywhere, there is a chance for you to still do some virtual traveling, whether you're in the classroom with your students or if you're just hanging out at home. And it has to do with one of my favorite Google tools, which is Google Maps. And specifically, these are the Google Maps treks. And so what Google Maps treks are, it's kind of like Google Maps Street View. And if you're familiar with Street View, it's the idea that Google has these panoramic cameras that will shoot these pictures that you can look, you know, well, allow you to look up and down and all around and zoom in. Um, and what they do is they take those cameras to these fantastic destinations all around the world. Sometimes they have to get the a waterproof version of those cameras so they can go underwater. Other times they stick them in a backpack or on someone's back. And what they do is they take all of this imagery of these amazing locations and then turn it into a real cool multimedia experience. And so at a time of year, when we're talking about traveling to different places, it will allow you to go to some pretty cool places. Like for instance, you could go to um, you know, the Amazon basin, you can go to the Eiffel Tower, you can scale El Capitan, that uh, rock face at Yosemite National Park in California, you can go underwater to the Great Barrier Reef. And so there's just all sorts of cool places that you can go and it gives you multimedia so you can see video, you can hear audio of the travelers themselves, um, some interactive pictures and all of that. So If traveling isn't in your plans, but you kind of want to do one of those uh, staycations, so to speak, then this is a way for you to get at least a little bit of that experience. I love this. And this is actually a big mashup of Street View, Maps, Google Earth. I mean, they all kind of come together. So I, I clicked on the pyramids of ancient Egypt. And so right now I'm on Street View of the Great Pyramid of Giza, and it's, 
I mean, it's I'm staring up at the scale of this Uh and the and the steepness of it. And of course, my mind is just constantly amazed by how this was man made thousands of years ago. It was thousands of years ago, right? Um, (laughs) Somebody's going to correct me on that. That's okay. That's okay. But I mean, the, the fact that I mean, I'm looking at it and I can see the horses down at the bottom, like real horses, and they're next to the stones that are putting this together. And the stones are almost as big as the horse. So (laughs) I'm just trying to contemplate, you know, how physically this, you know, this was constructed. And anyway, so some great conversations. This is a place that I've always wanted to actually visit myself, but um, would would love to be able to explore things. And I love the fact that we have this at our fingertips, even though some of us won't actually get the, the ability to go to some of these places in real life. We can see it and get that experience in our classroom or in, and explore the things that we want to go see. Yeah, definitely. So some other things you may want to explore over spring break, maybe some free resources or free courses that are out there for you. So Matt and I wanted to be sure and mention a few things here. I have a free course on how to create magnetic poetry with Google Slides and Google Drawings. Now, if you have no interest in poetry, don't worry. The skills that you learn with slides and drawings will carry you into other types of activities that you can create for your students. So really, it's a it's a quick course. It's something you can, you can learn in your free time. And I have a Google Classroom Masterclass as well as a Google Slides Masterclass that you can explore and learn more about those tools and become more of a master if you like. Yeah. And there's a couple of other ones that, that kind of have my interest too. Uh, I just recently published a post on the ditch that textbook blog about hyperdocs. And while cruising around the hyperdocs website, I had found this um, section that they have called hyperdocs on air. And it has all of these videos where you have teachers that have used hyperdocs in their classes and they talk about, you know, what it is that they do and tips and tricks and ideas and all of that. And it looks like there's about 12 free videos that you can go check out there if you want to learn a little bit more about HyperDocs over break. And then I thought I'd mention this too. I got to partner with the folks at Screencastify to create this one hour free online course called Master the Screencast. So if you're interested in learning more about Screencastify or just about Screencast videos in general and what you can do with them in the class, this is a pretty easy course and you get a free badge afterwards too. So um, yeah, lots of things that we could do. You know, it is kind of nice sometimes uh, when we have some time off. I think we educators are kind of a funny bunch uh, where um, I don't know, not everybody's like this, but we get a little bit of time to ourselves. And what do some of us want to do? We want to go learn new things that we can do in our class. So, um, you know, if that's you, you've got some of these course options that are available to you. And then Casey and I picked out a couple of books that had our interest too, because I know, um, you know, a lot of us are, are big readers and are interested in, in checking new books out and everything. And I just recently picked this one book up. I have a friend, Kim Strobel, who is a, uh, she does professional development, um, but she's also a happiness coach, which I thought was kind of a cool title. And um, so she's been talking about how the, you know, the power of a positive mindset um, has really been proven by science in a lot of ways. And she encouraged me to check out this one book called The Happiness Advantage by Sean Acor. And the subtitle of this says, How a Positive Brain Fuels Success in Work and Life. And it's so fascinating to me to see how, you know, just being at positive instead of in a negative mindset or even a neutral mindset has such an impact on how effective we are and how efficient we are. So, you know, if you're looking for books to read over break, I think this is one that that is totally worth checking out. Yes. And I was doing some digging, too, because I was just trying to see what's what's new, what's coming out. I was yeah. s- skimming around Amazon and 
lo and behold, the infamous <laughs> Jerry Brooks or Gary Brooks. I'm not sure how you pronounce his name. Y'all know him yes. uh, from YouTube and his amazing videos. He's hilarious. He's entertaining. Mm -hmm. And he's also very poignant. He has a way of pointing at things that are happening in education that we all kind of understand and that it's actually, you know, this this truth that's behind the the comedy that he provides for us as well. But he wrote a book and actually you can only pre-order it. So technically, I don't think you would get this in time to read it for spring break, but it was worth mentioning. It's called Go See the Principal, True Tales from the School Trenches. And I'm just scanning through so you can, you know, look inside on Amazon and see the the chapters and everything. But I don't want to go back to school. Principal tips for motivating and bonding your team. So that's that's chapter one. Chapter two, classroom placement, the methods to our madness. Oh, I really want that because <laughs> many a principal has confused me in my day in terms of, of classroom placements and schedules and everything else like that. Uh, chapter three is school supplies. Yes, we really need all that stuff. So I, I would love to read this. This is on my list. I will probably pre-order it because I'm sure there is um, some some entertaining writing that goes along with this, knowing his style. And so I'm, I'm pretty excited to see this one pop up in my Amazon feed. The other one that I wanted to mention that I just noticed as well is from Sir Ken Robinson. So we probably all know Sir Ken. I mentioned him like I know him some way because I talk <laughs> right? about him all the time. Yeah, me and Sir Ken. Yeah, we uh -huh. just hang out. No, I you hang I've out never on actually... YouTube. You know, I mean, that's kind of something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he still has the most um, viewed TED Talk yes, ever. I believe uh, so. Do, do schools kill creativity? And he's written several books, but this one is called "You, Your Child, and School: Navigate Your Way to the Best Education." So I think this one is really coming at the parent side of things. So I think they're trying to help parents maybe understand more of what's going on in education. And I'm really excited to see this one too. So uh, be sure that you check those out. Of course, Amazon is my favorite place for, for searching and finding new things online. I also wanted to mention though, if you're looking for something to do over spring break, depending when your spring break begins, I am facilitating a book study of the Shake Up Learning book and it starts on March 28th. So shameless plug there, but if you want to join us, the book study is completely free. And of course, you can find all of the links to these books, to these courses, and to all of the fun things that we've been sharing in our show notes at googleteachertribe.com slash 80. There's a letter in your mailbox. Hey, you know what? This is all your mail. Hey, maybe I'll give you a call sometime. You've got mail. So as Matt likes to say, we're going to jump in the mailbag. Let's jump in the mailbag! <laughs> Yay! Yay! I feel like we're on like Pee Wee's Playhouse or something. <laughs> 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 like the word of the day or something. Ah! What was, what was it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, Lord. Okay. It's, it's, it's time to get into this. All right. So we're in the mailbag and we have a fabulous idea <laughs> from Craig Clement in Garland, Texas. And Craig was inspired by the Google My Maps episode that we did a couple of weeks ago. And he has this great idea for creating a choice board using Google My Maps. So take it away, Craig. Hey, Matt and Casey, Craig Clement, RTI facilitator from Dallas, Texas here. Um, I was just listening to the episode on Google My Maps and I had an idea. I've never done this before, um, but it's basically like a choice board, but on Google My Maps where a teacher could go and put different pins around the map and then students kind of choose their own adventure um, and go through and complete different tasks at each, at each of the different points. And then they could use the layers to highlight the route that they took um, on their adventure. Thank you. Love it. Fantastic. Y'all know I love me some choice boards. This is a great idea. And Craig, I want you to do it, run with it, and then share it with me. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see it. I want to know how this works. So if you try it, please, please, please share it with me. Or if anyone else out there has ever done this or wants to do it, I think this is a fabulous idea to use the mapping situation there, the application 
mapping situation. Mm -hmm. We're mm -hmm. just going to go with it. Mm -hmm. See, I'm making up words already. Yep, yep, that's right. <laughs> to, uh, to create a learning mini or a choice board. So thank you for that, Craig. All right. No, I think that's great too. And you all do know that Casey and I do love to see your examples from the classroom. We love to see that, um, you know, that real stuff coming, you know, straight from the hands of students and from, from your classroom. So please, please, please always think about sharing those with us. We love to pass them along. The next part of our mailbag comes to us from Mark from Wisconsin. And here's what Mark says. He says, I have an assignment in literature that requires students to proofread a poorly written letter, roughly 50 mistakes. Some days I feel like I would make 50 mistakes in a poorly written letter and make corrections. Is there a way to turn off spell check in the shared document? I have it turned off in the master copy, but when I send it out through Classroom, each of their Chromebooks turns spell check back on. All right, so I see where Mark is coming from here. And the direct answer to his question is, I am not aware of a way to turn off spell check in a shared document. Like he said, if it's in the master copy, I mean, I suppose there might be a way to get into the global settings of each student's Chromebook and to turn off the uh, spell check within each one of their Chromebooks. So that's going to be the short, quick answer is, I don't know of a way. Let's get to a little bit bigger picture point here is, I see that within this assignment, we want students to proofread a poorly written letter where there are roughly 50 mistakes and to make corrections. I'm going to suggest that this is a perfect opportunity for us to revise the assignment a little bit. And I know that in the past, we've had, you know, letters and other documents where we've had a printed copy of them and we've had to go through and make sure that we can find mistakes. But I think the reality is that today is that spell check and grammar check and all of those things are a part of our lives. Those little squiggly red lines are not going away. Um, well, they may end up becoming a different, you know, different thing. It may be a different colored one or a box or something like that. But the ability to flag all of those is something that is very much here. And so instead of trying to find a way, just going to throw this out there, instead of finding a way to get rid of a feature that is not going away, what if we encourage students to find a way to live within that ecosystem, but to do it in a smart way? And here's what I mean by that. If we go through and we try to turn spell, or if we try to correct all of the mistakes that spell check suggests, Sometimes spell check isn't as smart as we'd like it to be, and it suggests bad changes. So maybe the task here is to go through and maybe find some of those things that spell check misses, or spell check suggests something, and we decide, oh, maybe spell check doesn't totally have this right, and then have a you know have an opportunity for students to reflect on that experience of what it was like to work through spell check and grammar check and to see how often was it correct and how can we be smart consumers of this tool within docs and within other um, activities or within other tools. So, uh, so again, the short answer to this question is I can't think of a way to turn off spell check. The bigger picture answer to this question is I'm not sure if we want to turn it off. If it's something that's not going away. Now, if, um, you know, this, this obviously doesn't mean that we want to totally quit grading, spelling, and all of that stuff. That's not the direction that I'm going with this at all. Um, I think it's living within the ecosystem, the digital ecosystem that we have available to us. Um, I know this isn't everybody's view, and if you've got a take on this as well, we would certainly love to hear it from you. Um, but yeah, I think I think if that's if those are our options, I think maybe maybe we look at changing the task instead of fixing that one little feature. So we got a couple of blog posts to share with you, and then we're going to wrap this episode up. I just recently published a post on the Ditch That Textbook blog that I co-authored with uh, Carly Mora, who is a big influence in our Ditch Book community on Twitter. And it's called the HyperDocs Toolbox, 14 Engaging Example Activities. And so Carly and I, what we did was we went through some popular HyperDocs activities and 
we scrolled down through the HyperDocs website and found some really good HyperDocs. And we thought, if we can find some example activities within those HyperDocs, then maybe if people could see what one of those activities might look like, it would give them some ideas to fill up their own HyperDocs. And so we've got these um, these activities. We tell you the key tool that makes the whole thing stay together. And then we tell you why we think it works, why we think it's a good activity. So these are all things that you can use yourself um, as standalone activities, but definitely as activities that you can plug into a HyperDoc too. So if you're kind of interested in this whole HyperDocs thing and you're interested in learning more and upping your game, this might be a good place to go. That's fantastic. You know how many people will love that, especially because we all love HyperDocs. So many ideas. And I love that you shared that, Matt. And of course, Carly is amazing as well. So I'm going to have to spend some time digging into your post. Now, I have a post that I'm going to share, and it's actually an updated post that I update every year. And it started out, I will tell you the title because it's actually still in the URL. 20 awesome apps that integrate with Google Classroom. So as Google opened up Google Classroom to be able to talk to third party applications and, you know, the things that allow us to create assignments from other apps that are not Google, they have continued to grow, of course, over the years. So this year's update is I think there are 63 on this list, so I just titled it 60 plus awesome apps that integrate with Google Classroom. So if you're a Google Classroom user and you want to know how to make the most of Google Classroom and help use your other favorite applications, this is how it works. So most of these work with that share to classroom option. So if you're in, say, Discovery Education, you can click on the Share to Classroom button and it will pop up and allow you to create the assignment from there. Some of these work a little bit differently. Some of these have to do with our student information systems, but you will find some of your favorite applications in this list like Book Widgets, Brain Pop, Classcraft, Curiosity.com, Discovery Education, Ed Puzzle, Flipgrid, Go Guardian, Google Cast for Education, Insert Learning, tons of ideas here. So if you're looking for some new apps or you're wondering how you can actually work better within the Google Classroom platform, you may want to take a look at this, po- this post here. And one more quick thing that I want to share, the new Shake Up Learning Show podcast starts on March 26th. So if you're listening to this podcast that comes out on March 25th, tomorrow is the the premiere date. So I hope you will join me. I'm not leaving the Google Teacher Tribe. Matt and I have way too much fun doing this. So um, I'm just going to be talking some more. So if you want if you want some more ideas, you can hop on over and listen to the new Shake Up Learning show, which will drop five episodes on Tuesday, March 26th. Thank you so much for listening to episode 80 of the Google Teacher Tribe podcast. We have so much fun sharing ideas with you each week, and we hope that you're all having a blast on spring break and that you're not working too much. But if you choose to, that maybe we have inspired you with some things that you can learn or maybe try in your classroom if you have some extra time. And we hope that you will continue to leave us some voice messages, questions, speak pipes, and sharing on the Twitters with the GT Tribe hashtag. And of course, we would love it if you would leave us a review and let us know what you think of the Google Teacher Tribe podcast. Yes, absolutely. So we will catch you on the next episode of the Google Teacher Tribe. Bye, y'all. Thanks for listening to the Google Teacher Tribe podcast. Keep up with every new episode by subscribing on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher, and by visiting GoogleTeacherTribe.com. Get in on the conversation on Twitter by using the hashtag GTTribe. Until next time, keep harnessing the G Suite power, and may the Googles be with you.